Hello, welcome, and thanks for joining us on this edition of News 2. I'm Sandra Guman Singh. Topping our newscast tonight, government and hospital officials continue to scramble to save Juan Louis Hospital in the wake of a decertification. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services are removing Juan F. Louis from its program effective October 9th. They say the hospital is out of compliance based on CMS's last inspection. News News Erica Parsons has more from that report. The CMS report on Juan Louis Hospital spotlights a long list of concerns, from problems with governance to issues of patient care. CMS terminated the Medicare agreement with JFL effective October 9th. They found that the St. Croix Hospital didn't meet 10 COPs or conditions of participation. One area was compliance with local and federal laws where officials failed to notify the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that JFL's nuclear medicine program was dormant. CMS says the lack of a governing board specifically and legally responsible for the hospital's conduct is another problem, especially when that board was never told about dozens of cases where patients' health and safety were threatened. CMS in their report also found patients' rights were violated when patients weren't allowed full privacy during care or when steps weren't taken to protect patient medical records while areas of the hospital were under construction. The CMS report said the hospital failed because of staff shortages during anesthesia services. The ER was also criticized because there weren't enough qualified medical and nursing staff to service the emergency room. CMS found these problems during a five-day visit to JFL on July 28th. They also conducted a complaint survey based on concerns they received. JFL was in jeopardy of losing its certification in October 2011, but avoided termination by submitting a systems improvement agreement the following month that gave them an extension to February 2013. The CMS report chastised officials because there was no governing body in place to oversee the adoption of any improvements. Erica Parsons, News 2. Now, hospital officials have 60 days after the termination date to request a hearing to appeal CMS's decision. Count on two to keep you updated. After a two-day trial in the district court in St. Thomas, the federal jury today found postal clerk Rosemary Peltier, guilty of embezzlement. Peltier, who was employed at the Aubrey Otley Post Office in Estate Thomas, was indicted earlier this year by a federal grand jury for misappropriation of postal funds, embezzlement of government property, and false entries and reports of money. Documents indicate Peltier devised a scheme to defraud and embezzle from USPS by misusing the machine used to issue and Record, record money orders between 2010 and 2013. Peltier embezzled nearly $30,000 according to court documents. Peltier was released on conditions and faces a maximum sentence of 10 years imprisonment and fines of up to $250,000 on each count of conviction. The current unemployment rate is 13% and that's lower than it has been in the last couple of years, and that's according to Department of Labor officials. Now, Department of Labor's Commissioner Albert Bryan Jr. and the Unemployment Insurance Director Allison Digazon will be the guests on Talk To tonight. They will discuss labor and the workforce in the USVI and more. Now, Talk To is a powerful subject-driven talk show covering politics, education, the economy, crime, and current events. It airs Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. only on CBS TV 2, so be sure to tune in right after News 2. The Senate Finance Committee, chaired by Senator Clifford Graham, met at the Earl B. Otley Legislative Hall on Tuesday to review budget year 2015 bills. While some senators did acknowledge the committee's hard work, there are some senators who feel the process did not serve Virgin Islanders very well. This process which I have been uh, criticized for calling it a dog and pony show, does not in and of itself really serve the people of this territory the way it should. Uh, firstly, the members of the finance committee are not always all of the members of the majority, yet the members of the majority are the ones who determine the budget. Um, unfortunately for the people who elect us, the members of the majority and those charged with developing the budget do not participate fully in the finance uh, committee. 
In other news, what are your thoughts, thoughts about the permit application by Coral World to construct a nearshore dolphin exhibit at Coral World? Well, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Jacksonville District, will be hosting a public meeting here to get your input. And that's on Thursday, September 25th at the Charles Turnbull Regional Library, Tutu Park Mall, St. Thomas. It begins at 6 p.m. Now, the Army Corps of Engineers con considers the value of the aquatic ecosystems involved, the views of federal, state, and local agencies, and interest groups, and 21 public interest factors. A permit will be granted unless its issuance is found to be contrary to the public interest. So be sure to head out to the public hearing. Well, last week, we reported on the shocking details of the report by the VI Inspector General on the auctioning practices of the Real Property Tax Division within the Lieutenant Governor's Office. On top of the manipulated bidding scheme, there is also evidence of faulty record keeping. News 2 April Night has the tales. A rigged auction and botched paperwork. These are some of the biggest findings by the VI Inspector General, who laid out major mishaps in auctions held by the Real Property Tax Division. It should have been caught from day one. An illegal policy change allowed a manipulated bidding scheme orchestrated by a handful of bidders. They freeze the bidding process by bidding high amounts and then fail to pay the deposit. In the end, the property goes to an accomplice at a very low price. But there are also anomalies in the paperwork. That can only happen with that. Those sheets are only prepared within the lieutenant governor's office. The way the auction works, the division tallies the names of the bidders, the properties they bid on, and the amounts they bid. They would then pick out the winning bidders and log that information in what's called a 123 sheet. But the inspector general found that the names and amounts on the initial tallies of bidders did not match the 123 sheets. John Doe may have registered as, as bidder number, you know, number one, let's say, and won the property. But when we look at, at the 123 sheet, mm -hmm. Is Jane Smith. Sometimes the winning bidders on the 123 sheet did not even bid at all. Or not even at the auction. We even found instances where people not even at the auction got properties. The inspector general recommended to void all of the questionable auctions. He did express concern on the governor's response that stated the auctions will be voided if practicable. What do you mean by practicable? The advisory opinion from the Attorney General does not give the option of voiding or not voiding an illegal transaction. The investigation is ongoing. The Inspector General says the Attorney General will have to decide whether to file charges, but he says his office will be keeping an eye on the government's response. Reporting for News 2, I'm April Knight. And News 2 will keep you updated on any developments in the Inspector General's investigation of the property auctions. Turn our attention overseas. The U.S. and five Arab nations took aim at ISIS in Syria today. President Obama authorized airstrikes at the Islamic group's headquarters in eastern Syria. U.S. aircraft took part in the raids and U.S. Navy ships also fired missiles. Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Bahrain, Jordan and the United Arab Emirates also participated in the fight against ISIS. The group targeted the militants' storage facilities, military vehicles and a training compound. President Obama also authorized strikes against the Khorasan Group, another terror organization made up of al-Qaeda veterans. U.S. officials say 40 other nations have offered to help. Meanwhile, keeping our eye on the economy, Spirit Airlines is known for charging extra for just about everything. And now the low-cost carrier is hiking baggage fees during the holiday season. Between December 18th and January 5th, you'll have to pay an extra $2. Spirit says it wants to encourage customers to pack a bit lighter. So there is room to squeeze in everyone's bags during the busy travel season. Here's a look at the New York Stock Exchange with our stock market watch. Everything down, the Dow 116, NASDAQ 19, S&P 11. Coming up on News 2, U.S. CIS officials, they are very excited. They held a groundbreaking ceremony Tuesday morning at their new site in Smith Bay. The plan to story building will be more conducive, they say, for both their employees and their clients. Details coming up. The St. Thomas Office of the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services will be moving. And although this is not happening until a year from now, 
USCIS officials are very excited. They held a groundbreaking ceremony Tuesday morning at their new site in Smith Bay. The planned two-story building, they said, will be made more conducive for both their employees and their clients. It will also be environment-friendly with its own solar farm on the rooftop. It has been in the works for quite a while and we moved into our old building in 1997 before we were even Department of Homeland Security. You know, there's been a lot of changes in personnel and other in that office and the office just isn't conducive to good customer service and it's not a great office for our employees. So we've been working very diligently to get them a new office here. So hopefully it's a, a more convenient space and also, you know, if nothing else, it's going to be much better parking. Um, the, you know, the traffic, etc. We think it's a, a much better location and when they come in they will really see what USCIS is and it gives a good representation of the United States government. The Virgin Islands Department of Education has been awarded $745,000 in U.S. Department of Education funds to improve behavioral outcomes and learning conditions for students. This funding is part of the fiscal year 2014 new awards for the School Climate Transformation Grant local educational agency grants program, which is among several that are designed to work together to help make, make school safer, as well as working on improving mental health services for students and young adults. The program was conceptualized in the President's 2013 Now is the Time Comprehensive Plan. The goal of the program is to provide competitive grants to local educational agencies. Also, the Frederick said Healthcare Inc. is a recipient of a $204,000 grant from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services aimed at expanded services, and that's according to the delegate Donna Christensen. This grant is part of the Healthcare Cluster Grant Program and is considered supplemental funding. The objective of the grant is to provide for expanded and sustained national investment in health centers funded under Section 330 of the Public Health Service Act, including expanding the current safety net on a national basis by creating new access point and supporting expanded service at existing health centers. Well, mark this on your calendar, the Women's Coalition of St. Croix and the Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault Council are doing something a little different this year. Thursday is the National Day of Remembrance for murdered victims, and the two groups are focusing on children. On Thursday, children who've lost loved ones to violence will have the opportunity to use arts and crafts as a way to heal. We're going to do an art project with them, which will help them to make picture frames for them to put the pictures of their loved ones in. We get a chance to talk about the grieving process, and a lot of people have difficulty talking to children about death, but we'll have counselors there that will be able to walk them through the process and explain why we're doing it and, you know, kind of let them know that it's okay to miss this person and this is what it means when they're gone and, you know, these are the things that they may be feeling and, you know, when you go to school and people talk about, oh, my daddy this and oh, my mommy this and you don't have one because you lost them due to violence, it takes on a different set, a mindset within yourself and that's what we're trying to work through with them. And the event will take place at the Women's Coalition's Children's Center at 13A and B King Street in Christiansted. Everyone is encouraged to wear red and black. Well, if you missed it, some of the USVI's best small manufacturers and other businesses were on hand to display their goods and learn more about how to export their products and services to foreign buyers. The VI Economic Development Authority's State Trade and Export Program, or the STEP Program, hosted the 2014 U.S. Virgin Islands International Artistry and Business Expo. And that went on from Friday to Sunday at the Mark Marine Center at Antilles School. The first time Expo was co-sponsored by the U.S. Small Business Administration. Many exhibitors were set up at the Expo in the industries of food, gift and arts, beauty and wellness, music, jewelry, fashion, building and industrial materials. Be sure to stick around. Your news to AccuWeather forecast is coming up next.